Yeah, yeah so um, these little minivans have been done for years, and everyone has seen them and so forth. But it really matters on how you decide to coach the movements. I use minivans as far as teaching isometric strength and stability by pushing into the ground. It's not about the lifting leg ever. It's about the instant that when you do lift the leg, the opposite leg is pushing down and into the ground. And you're going to hear more on that in the running mechanics, I'm sure. We train the whole chain, we train posterior. That elbow that has to go backwards, as Darren was describing, that doesn't just happen. It has to be coached. And in an injury process, we coach it. This particular athlete is three, uh, three months and a week uh, after ACL reconstruction. So, and I'll, I'll tell you on some more of the athletes are uh, during the videos. The BOSU ball, I, I'm using it only a little bit these days. And I feel as that with artificial instability, if you want to get good at artificial instability, do a lot of artificial instability. I'm not necessarily convinced it transfers to performance. I think it wakes things up, but you must always come back to the ground. So it's good to do early in the rehab, but in the uh, reconditioning phase. But don't keep making things more and more unstable, thinking you're going to get better. Uh, you know, 15K uh, uh, sandbag, working on more kinds of stability. Pool is a great environment. We can offload an athlete, and we can work on a lot of different types of mechanics. We can also train rate of force development, time to peak force in the water. And there is papers out there that show that that takes place at or better than on land. Granted, you don't have the load for, for um, um, power production as far as watts per kilogram, but this athlete's doing single leg bounding. He'll probably never go back to doing single leg bounding on the ground again. He's a veteran athlete with conjugal defects. He'll never need to do it. But the movement mechanics of single leg bounding are good to teach for running mechanics. We use these little pl uh, paddles on their feet just to work on speed, strength, endurance. And that's slow speed, isn't it, relative to sprinting? but we get a really lactate-rich environment, and they get tired. The trampoline, now this is really cool. So I started using these track tramps many, many years ago, because they're fun. But these are athletes right here that are all about three months out of their surgery or so forth, ACL reconstructions. They haven't even begun running on land yet, but we're simulating what could be taking place, and we simulate the coaching. But when we decrease the, um, the uh, load into the ground, they're more appreciable of doing the movement you're asking them to do because they don't expect to have the pain or soreness. The rebound effect of that trampoline makes you feel extremely fast, and it's good to train the speed on a regular basis. This particular um, backward cycle, I started doing standing backward cycle because most, uh, probably 90% of the time, any athlete that has a patellotendinopathy, they can do this movement without any patellotendinopathy and we get the excellent BMO activation. Only because after they do it, you look at their BMO and it's pumped. Standing forward cycle, pushing, pushing, preparing for running, high lactate, makes you feel horrible, so it's a good conditioning tool used in the right place. These silly little resistance boards. When I started working, I had no weight room. I had no fancy center. I had little cords like this. So this particular uh, series on resistance board, this is about pushing into the ground, increasing isometric strength and stability around the ankle, knee, hip, and core on a regular basis. And this is in preparation for running. If they can't do this, then they can't run. Because I'm not interested in running, I'm interested in slowing down, right? My statement I've always said, if you can't slow shit down, don't speed it up, right? And so you have to learn how to slow down and there and just talk about that. So, we have to get them very stable and slower movements, with strength movements, increase the speed, increase the quality of their deceleration capabilities. This, hip extension, all right? There's a lot of good things that are happening there, and then it's stability on the way back. It's just a tool, and there's no science, and there's no number telling you what to do there. This is the art of training athletes versus the science behind what does his peak force look like on a knee extension machine, this is just training good quality movements, and there's an application for this on a regular basis. Getting ready for a fast cutting, fast change of direction. He's a rugby player, looks like one. Very strong. And then the speed gets higher and higher. This athlete is actually you know, a year out of surgery, or year 0.5, and he came back and spent a week with me for uh, a reconditioning camp, a tune-up. 
strength training. They have to lift weights, I feel, they have to get stronger. But footballers don't have to lift big heavy weights, they just have to be strong enough to withstand and demand the sport. I also think we need to spend probably 80% of our exercises single leg emphasis. It is a single leg, right into a left sport for the most part. So lots of different approaches, but get them stronger. Yes, this is a rugby player. Same exercises that I do with footballers. Slow eccentric strength, five count down, kind of from all that work that's been done forever on slow eccentric with a balanced component to it, single leg emphasis. Hamstrings are important. There's kind of the inverted upside down Russian hamstring. It's fun to do. It's a different feeling than, and, but I can go single leg. It's hard to do a Russian single leg, um, especially if they've had a hamstring graft. A little perturbation training, just being able to maintain a total drag traction type stuff. Total body training started getting a little bit faster now and so forth. So now it's just getting very reactive. A lot of the game is spent in that range of motion. It's not spent in deep flex positions on a regular basis. So I'm working on getting stiff. Stiff in the foot, stiff in the ankle, the calf, and all the way up through the chain. And that stiffness is critical to set up if they want to have good run mechanics. So what I've seen is there's a lot of athletes that are squishy. They don't know how to push into the ground. They don't know how to have good isometric tone. And they can't appreciate those things. So therefore, on change of direction, they often give, just like Darren was talking about with that athlete he uh, uh, spoke of. Fast eccentric. The body weight does a wonderful job if you move it fast enough. You will get down to lay down set muscle soreness on a regular basis when you use fast body weight eccentric training. And if you're producing DOMS and it's fast and quick, there's a good chance we're getting type 2 recruited. Okay? Add a little load to it, same drills I do with all the footballers when they come over. So if they've got a hamstring, a hip injury, a knee injury, or an ankle injury, I haven't changed any of these exercises. I introduce them when the time comes, of course, at the appropriate level. I build them up for it. But it, the sport doesn't matter necessarily on a multi-directional movement, moving athletes, right? The exercise selection is appropriate to their you know, injury and the number of weeks or months that they are post-injury. But get them fast. If this was a hamstring, and I do the same exercise for a hamstring, you've got to have the courage to put the hamstring in these kinds of loads on a regular basis. You have to have the courage to go just shy of failure. Because we heard earlier that the tests in the gym don't want to go there sometimes, the biomechanical tests.